there's there's almost a kind of BPS speak in terms of um, the bullying harassment argument uh, against people who are making consistent complaints that they carry on pursuing rather than giving up because they're not getting anywhere. If there could at least be a network of people who are BPS members who themselves got together and were prepared to be a, a reform group, there's no point doing it inside the BPS. Forget that, because they'll just they'll just crush you. Hello, and welcome to Locked Up Living, the podcast which looks at resilience in challenging organisations, such as, but not only, prisons and hospitals for mentally ill prisoners and patients. My name is David Jones, and together with Naomi Murphy, I present your Locked Up Living podcast. Delighted to welcome along today uh, Pat Harvey, formerly known as Pat Green, and perhaps to um, those within psychology, and David Pilgrim. Pat has had a long and illustrious career as a clinical psychologist. She set up the Lancashire in-service training course, which is now the Lancaster course for clinical psychology, was a member of the Lancashire Multi-Agency Child Protection Committee, has served as a Mental Health Act Commissioner, been a member of an independent panel of inquiry into three homicides and was the chair of the DCP for the British Psychological Society before retiring from the NHS and also psychology practice in 2002. Since then she's trained as and become a practicing and exhibiting artist before becoming engaged in issues related to the functioning of the BPS in 2020. David Pilgrim is Honorary Professor of Health and Social Policy at the University of Liverpool and Visiting Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Southampton. Now semi-retired, he trained and worked in the NHS as a clinical psychologist before completing a PhD in psychology and then a master's in sociology. With this mixed background, his career was split then between clinical work, teaching and mental health policy research. He remains active in the Division of Clinical Psychology and the History and Philosophy section of the BPS and was chair of the latter between 2015 and 2018. He's author of at least seven books, including The Sociology of Mental Health and Illness, which was winner of the 2006 BMA Medical Book of the Year Award. And his most recent books are Child Sexual Abuse, Moral Panic or State of Denial and Critical Realism for Psychologists. I think it's fair to say that both today's guests have spent much of their lifetime serving as critical friends to psychology, although as with most people who act as critical friends, their efforts haven't always been appreciated. Today, we're really pleased to invite them along to discuss why it's important that organisations are open to constructive feedback and why each of us should be prepared to take a stand when we witness malpractice. Delighted to have you both here today. Welcome. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, uh, I'm very pleased indeed to meet with the uh, two of you today. Thanks very much for coming along. So each of you have had quite a lot of visibility during your careers in clinical psychology due to your willingness to take on positions of responsibility and also to challenge the status quo. However, Pat, you retired 20 years ago and David, you describe yourself as semi-retired what drew you back into more actively critiquing psychology again? Perhaps Pat first? Um, I, I suppose that the whole of my career, I was um, actively critiquing psychology and certainly critiquing services. Um, I, when you say uh, I was involved in setting up the, the Lancashire course, that was with three other people, one of whom was um, the person who was the whistleblower in the Whittingham Inquiry in 1967, which was regarded by some people as the, the first large uh, hospital inquiry of that kind. So um, going back to your question, um, the, the reason I, I became involved again, after wandering off into the wilderness and not being a psychologist for quite some time, um, relates to a specific issue that I got involved with, which I think we may be talking about later. Um, and then linking up with Dave again, who Dave and I had worked together for, for several years, uh, one stage, <clears throat> and um, finding out that um, things were 
a lot worse than I would have imagined they would have been um, it, within professional and um, academic psychology uh, and organisational um, issues. So that's what drew me back in. Thank you. How about you, Dave? Um, yeah, I think um, just to pick up where Pat left off there, I think the, the commonality was that we were both uh, in the 80s uh, uh, concerned about conditions uh, at uh, what is now Ashworth Hospital. And, uh, in different ways, we played a part in the build up to the Ashworth inquiry. So that sensitised me certainly to problems in institutions. Um, uh, and within that, it became obvious that if you were a psychologist, you had to act like a, a professional with integrity. Uh, that goes without saying, I know, but it sometimes needs restating. Um, and then, if, then rec more recently, what struck me as I continued to write uh, about psychology uh, was that there was um, a certain uh, flabbiness that had been introduced into the culture of the BPS, which was being more preoccupied with marketization and the bureaucracy itself rather than the main concerns about uh, public uh, protection. So there was a connection there for me. Um, maybe later I'll come on to talk a bit more about that, in particular in relation to freedom of expression. But I think really there is this shared history about concern about integrity within institutions. And, and, and Pat and I both now turned our attention actually onto our own society in that regard. So that's really where the, the link is at. Thank you, thanks very much. So the BPS is a registered charity and Dave, the Charity Commission received a dossier which comprised a number of concerns about the BPS this year, didn't it? Could you tell, you, could you tell us how this happened? Yeah, these were disparate elements uh, and it is worth clarifying um, uh, right at the beginning that uh, a number of people, particularly as they're becoming more and more aware of the problems in the BPS, are actually... I think uh, projecting sort of narratives onto them, which sometimes are accurate, sometimes are not. So just to just to clarify this, over the past year, um, a number of people through our, through networks of people like myself, Pat, and others, came to be aware that there were problems in the DPS, but they weren't all the same problems. So, for example, some people were concerned that they were sending in complaints and nothing was happening about a number of things. Uh, they were being blanked, uh, ignored, uh, fobbed off. Um, and this became quite serious and it became evident uh, across a number of particular topics. One was in relation to um, the um, extension of uh, prescribing rights to psychologists, which a number of psychologists complained about, but nothing happened about it. Another was a problem with the gender document, which Pat will say a bit about it in a while. That was problematic. Complaints were made, nothing happened about it. Um, I became involved because I used to write comms for the ethics uh, column of the DCP forum with a concern that I was I re realised that censorship was happening quite regularly within the norms of the new BPS. And this shocked me when I found out. It wasn't just because I was a victim of that censorship. I found out this was becoming a norm from, from the editor. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, that, was, that was another one. And, and a, f a final one, which I think is still taxing us, is the premature closure of the law and memory group, which again, I'll say a bit about in, in a while. But basically we were, through networking, we found out these concerns across a number of topics, all of which were following the same process, which that people tried to use the usual processes of a complaint. And then they found they were getting nowhere or they were fobbed off. And that I think is what stimulated the emergence of BPS Watch. Um, after that, we then discovered about the mistreatment of Nigel McLennan, who was the recently expelled president-elect, but that was after the event. So we did, it, we, there was no, as it were, conspiracy or, or connection with Nigel right at the beginning of our, our networking. That came later on, although now we are closely connected with him and trying to support him. So, uh, so that's basically a short story of that dossier. The, the Charity Commission then <clears throat> proceeded to be in contact with us and, and in dialogue, although to date we've not been terribly satisfi satisfied with the outcome of that yet, although the jury's out on that about how, how much they're going to prevaricate before they do something. I don't know if Pat wants to come in and add to that. Um, yes, I mean the, the, the dossier of complaints were seven fairly disparate issues 
um, and sending it to the charity commission. And, and we weren't the people who, who sent it. It was sent else by other people. Um, uh, it, it, it was clear that there was a sort of organisational problem here um, and that it was important to communicate that um, outside the BPS because efforts to, um, I, I mean, I could say more in relation to why the blog, if you, if, if you like now, because um, it became very apparent to us that the um, that the BPS was not informing people of, impo of important matters, was not consulting properly, um, and that the, um, the, there was a censorship issue as well, that uh, it was actually shutting down free discussion of important issues, and that basically the, the means of communicating from the BPS were uh, not conducive to people knowing what on earth was going on. And Dave and I were talking regularly at that stage and <laughs> we would, I think I may have said we need a blog originally and um, Dave ran with that and said, yes, I think we need, we really need to have a blog to inform members. And then of course, in order to publicize the blog, you've got to have a Twitter account these days. And so that's how that kind of thing took off. Um, the Psychologist is a the, the, the magazine, The Psychologist, and it's a magazine, we are told. Uh, in other words, don't have expectations of it. The magazine of The Psychologist is not in any sense balanced or independent in our view. Um, so we needed to move to A, communicating with uh, the Charity Commission, which ought to have a regulatory function over BPS and B alternative media. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm re reading some of your blogs recently, and and I thought this description that you mentioned just now, Dave, of people emerging, as it were, out of the the mist, who you realise you had some common interest with, albeit over, I think it was seven slightly different areas. I thought it was a very powerful description of how a process uh, develops. But um, I was unaware of, of these disputes. I'm, I'm not a psychologist by background um, until quite recently when I was talking with uh, Naomi. So one of the things that strikes me is that how, how, how does one tell, how does one think about a matter of degree? So how does one know that you two aren't just two disaffected old timers who no longer feel at the centre of things, if you'll excuse me putting it that way. Yeah, I, I can come in on that, David, very easily, which is I had no particular desire to do this. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I've got plenty of other projects in my life now, and I'm semi-retired, particularly writing books. And this getting involved with the blog has been a major amount of, of, of effort. Um, so I think that uh, uh, I think why it could be understood that we are disaffected old timers, but that more is more it's more accurate to say that that is the reason why we were free to be critical about matters that mattered. And we, what we discovered, and Pat will confirm this, is that many many people actually support us, but because they're mid career, are frightened to speak out. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, 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 I think, a serious cultural problem at the moment that. When Pat and I were younger, we would regularly in professional matters speak out and, have, and expect open debate. That was the norm. The norm has changed now, I think, for two reasons. One is to do with identity politics and people are scared just to say anything that might offend anybody else. Uh, and I think the second is the, the problem of social media where people are, uh, tend to hide and, and there's a norm of cowardice on, on social media. So we're not in a cultural climate in which it's easy for people now to speak out and maybe when you get to a certain age and you're retired and you no longer invest in your career it's just that bit easier to speak out but what you're speaking about I know does concern a lot of people again I think Pat will probably confirm well that. the other thing that that became very apparent was that when people um they may have wanted to keep a low profile on social media but when they tried to complain a number of them were themselves accused either directly or by implication by the BPS of bullying 
bullying staff at the BPS um, by virtue of the fact that they, I mean, Dave had an email which said something like, do you realise you've sent so many hundred emails? Well, a lot of those emails would have been because he hadn't had a reply. The, the, the tactic is, there's almost a kind of BPS speak in terms of um, um, the bullying, harassment um, argument uh, against people who are making consistent complaints that they carry on pursuing rather than giving up because they're not getting anywhere. Um, and so that, that's another a, um, aspect to um, the, re the requirement that you have persistence, even though it's exhausting and at times threatening. And I mean, we have been threatened on the blog with legal action. Um, I don't think either of us want to commandeer any of these issues. In fact, you know, um, it would be lovely if people took it off us. Wouldn't it, Dave? It would be fantastic. And also to add to that, Pat and I have uh, certainly got no interest in seeking any sort of appointment, elected or otherwise, in the BPS. No. We, we have no ambitions in that regard. This is, this is purely about trying to expose concerns, genuine concerns we have. And we just hope that other people can, can pick up on that and actually run with it so that we don't have to keep doing it. Yeah. Thank you. So do you think um, psychology has changed it over time? I mean, you're talking about kind of, you know, in society, people are scared to speak out. And I can certainly recognise that sense of social media. People, nobody wants to be trolled online. But I wonder, do you think the expectations within psychology have changed over time in terms of the importance of speaking up? Is there a different, is there a different yardstick now for people who are training as clinical psychologists or is you know there's some there's a courage involved in speaking up isn't there and you know are we not encouraging that and not fostering that in psychologists yes. When, yes. when perhaps it was previously or is it just coincidence yes. that you two know each other and and have had the moral support of somebody else who's who's got integrity to speak up but I'm interested in whether psychology has changed or whether the way we train people has changed so that people don't perhaps take on those the risk that's involved because it comes with a personal cost as, as you're describing. Yeah, I think I think Dave can give you some specifics to I think we would agree that that's true. Um, what would have been speaking up at one time is ruining someone's safe space now. In other words, if you hold a strong view and you want to talk about it, um, it can be said even within clinical psychology training now you are uh, undermining people's safe spaces it's you know safe space is not a bad concept in its own right but it's been commandeered to close things down I mean Dave you've actually been on the receiving end of the issue of training haven't you yeah th there have been instances where uh, I've had complaints against <clears throat> against me for the things I've published actually and sometimes when I've been asked to teach as a guest lecturer even though I'm not teaching about that topic Students have then complained about me that, to say that I'm, I'm, I'm transphobic. Um, and um, I think this is, this is very illuminating to me because something has happened culturally in the academy generally, not just in psychology, mm. actually probably since the 80s and with the emergence of postmodernism, which is that now uh, the, the basic assumption that we are free to speak out uh, and, 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 and to tolerate views which offend us has changed. There's been a normative shift uh, across the academy. I think this is a serious question for not just uh, training courses, it's a serious question for public policy, by the way. So this is a very mm. wide issue around the culture wars. Uh, but we, in our own small ways, have been victims of that within this. I'm not sure psychology is any different from any other discipline, although maybe other people here would, would comment on that I mean, from their background, whether it is any different, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure it's a fairly general uh, you know, issue. I'm, I'm certainly thinking about such issues whenever I'm responding or not responding to something on Twitter or Facebook. So it, it affects the whole discourse. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, just to clarify something for me there, because we, we've touched upon fear, the fear of speaking out and, and I wondered whether you link that with 
censorship and the censorship issue or whether the censors, censorship issue is something slightly bigger or different? Uh, I think it's part, part of the same piece. I think self-censorship is common now in academic life, uh, which again is a new phenomenon. Uh, I know people who have personal websites where they've so suddenly announced that they've deleted all their, all their publications from before a certain date because they think it might offend people now. I mean, that's just fascinating, self-censorship. On top of which, we've got the expectations through consumerism that, for example, on training courses, that students can just say, actually, we don't like so-and-so because they offend us. So we, we don't want you to invite them to teach us. Now, that's an extraordinary position to be in, particularly for people trying to develop a curriculum or run a course, particularly if they're still adhering to the old fashioned assumptions, of the legacy of the enlightenment, which is that freedom of expression is absolutely fundamental to, to academic exploration of any topic, whether it's in debate or in research. That has all changed. So I think we've got a serious problem facing us collectively, definitely. It's very worrying, isn't it? I mean, what it brings to my mind right now is, you know, when I went to Russia in the 80s and you'd peer at these photos on the walls um, of groups of men with Trotsky um, kind of missing. <laughs> and you knew he was there at one time when the photo was taken, but now he's gone, for example. It seems like yeah. a very, very worrying trend. So I think this is part, David, I think you're right, of a, of a new authoritarianism. So if we associate the old authoritarianism with that sort of bureaucratic leftism or also from the right, I think what's different now is that this authoritarianism is coming from below. It's, it's becoming amorphous and it's much more difficult to pin down because actually everybody's in the swim of it. And people tend to, in, in a very unreflective and unthinking way, tick boxes because it's just easier to go with the flow of that. Um, and maybe again, we can come on to that later yeah. when, when Pat talks about the, the challenge of uh, the, the gender document, which I think is, is, illustrates that problem. Thank you. Shall we go on to that then, Pat? One of the things yeah. you've been particularly concerned about was the position statement on gender. So can you talk us through why you saw this as being a problem? Yes, and I should point out that the position statement on gender actually includes... Um, sexualities and relationship um, diversity. Um, but the interesting thing is whether that should have been all part of the same document, given that the gender uh, part of it overshadows all the rest of it. Um, uh, so just to point that out, if people aren't familiar with that document. Right, well, um, Gender issues were something that I did come across from the early 70s, working in mental health. Um, it was almost always um, male to female issues. Um, and my abiding memory, because there weren't all that many people that, that I can actually remember individuals and remembering uh, how complex their social and psychological issues were then so that was that that was the thing that I brought into um, uh, having a, uh, an interest in this again the I went I've been retired for 20 years um, and it's almost never crossed my horizon in terms of I've met people with with uh, um, gender identification uh, issues um, uh, but it's it's never been an interest of mine or a concern of mine until and I need to be careful about how I talk about this because uh, the reason I got into it again um, or got into it at all uh, was because uh, a member of my family who is a social worker uh, working with children um, raised with me uh, the fact that she had put together a dossier of concern um, about uh, a family, a complex family situation uh, involved with social services, um, where a number of children had been, quote, transitioned, and the latest one being um, three to four years old and being sent to school in clothes of 
the, the other sex to which they were identified at birth, as the terminology now goes. Um, my, the, my family member consulted me um, and said, I'm about, I've, I've put together a dossier, I'm about to, in effect, whistleblow, she didn't use that terminology, um, with senior management about my concerns about a very uh, long-standing and complex situation. And that ended up going to court. Now, I did two things. One was that I um, said to her, you need to, very glibly and naively, oh, you need to get a really good psychological assessment of what's going on here. You need a psychologist report. Um, I say glibly and naively because that proved to be immensely problematic. Um, I also said to her, you need to talk to Dave Pilgrim <laughs> about this. Uh, he's a bit more in touch with what's going on with this kind of thing than I am. Um, and you also need, let's find out what the BPS is saying about this. So I, that was the point at which I read the, the I think it's the 2019 guidelines um, and was absolutely horrified by them. Instead of being a recognisable form of guideline, which is to assist practitioners with complex issues, um, maybe to set out uh, controversy if, if things are a matter of dispute, um, offering uh, some kind of uh, research background references um, that the, basically the the guidelines read as a polemic thou shalt um, in effect thou shalt affirm um, whatever the the person is presenting with and however old they are and however long they've, they have identified themselves as having these issues um, the my relative went to court, it meant uh, it, it became um, a, a national story in the press uh, with, with a very mixed and unsatisfactory outcome. Um, so this is where my energy came from. And what I decided to do was to look at the guidelines in, in detail and to make a formal complaint to the BPS about them about statements that were being made by individuals about them and about the guidelines themselves. Um, by this time, I'm becoming aware of the fact that complaints don't go well in the BPS at all. Uh, but I consider that I have a lot of background experience of how to make formal complaints and how they should be investigated. And so, I mean, Dave was saying to me at this time, oh, can you, you know, can you even be bothered to do this kind of thing? Um, I said, yes, I'm going to go through this process properly and push it as far as I can, uh, almost as an experiment to see what would happen. So can I just say to you at this stage, I'm not obsessed with this particular issue. It became the vehicle for, I mean, I am concerned about it, and particularly because of my relative telling me how this impacted on, on, children's lives um but but it's not an abiding concern of mine never has been um and it just became the vehicle to look up eventually to look at wider issues of what's going wrong with the complaints process what's going wrong uh in terms of debate etc etc so i did tweet um a, a, a longish thread about that complaint and what happened to it um, so it's on, on site, at Sykesop Watch UK at the moment. Various people have said to me overnight uh, and this morning, um, oh, this look, th these are people who, who support the concerns about the guidelines, uh, have said, oh, this looks a bit risky. They, they're going to try and get back at you. There'll be a pile on. Uh, they may even take legal action against you. I haven't named anyone. Um, I haven't actually specified the particular guidelines, mm -hmm. but, you know. Um, this sounds pretty frightening though, Pat. Well, that, you know, lots of uh, people are having these kind of problems and, you know, it is different for people who are still working. 
than it is for Dave and I. Because if I'm expelled from the BPS tomorrow, I shall use that for, quotes propaganda purposes. I don't care. What I care about is what's happened to the professional body and our ability to debate and training and, you know, on it goes. Yeah. Can, can I add to that maybe? Because it, it, it picks up on a, on a, a point that is, is of wider relevance, which is why we got involved with the, the blog at all. And, it, and really, there's a deeper structural problem about the BPS, which is that it, it is essentially misgoverned. And it's misgoverned uh, for a structural reason, which goes back to 1988, when it was on its Royal Charter was set up as a charity. And at that time, all of that was required was that it set up a board of trustees, which it did, but it was never specified what that board of trustees should be. We know now in best practice from the Charity Commission that a board of trustees should be totally independent of the activity of an organisation, totally. You sh- if you're a trustee, you should, you should be able to walk away from the role with no consequences for your career, your money, your status or whatever. That is the very opposite of what's happened in the BPS since 1988. And this, so this is why uh, if you look at our, our blog in some detail, we come back a lot to the structural problem of misgovernance. So the, the, the question is about its inability to deal with complaints properly or develop policies properly in a democratic way is a function of this deeper structural problem of misgovernance. So uh, can you, sorry, Dave, can you just explain yeah. to me as an outsider quite what you mean by that, this connection you know, between the trustees and the organisation? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so to, 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 to go back to the point about 1988, once they decided to set up a board, so-called board of trustees, which was actually people who were already in subsystems of the BPS, chair of the research board, uh, people who were nominated from the different subsystems, which were divisions or sections, they were all essentially people who were already inside the system. Okay, this then became complicated Within a within the ten or so years, with the introduction introduction of management systems. So, in addition to this tendency for a, a lack of oversight, proper oversight, independent oversight by the tr- trustee board, you then got another layer uh, uh, of managerialism, which became a power lobby within its own right. And then a set of problems emerged about that as well. So, when we look back over the past twenty odd years in the BPS, we found two problems really. We've got an oligarchy problem which is that a certain number of named people get recycled. Mm. Their names get recycled over the years. And this becomes a badge of honour. People say things like, I've been involved with the BPS for the past 20 years in this role and that role, as if it's something to be proud of. Whereas actually, in a healthy, open democracy, it should be something to be ashamed of, because it means that new blood is not coming in. So that's the oligarchy problem. The second problem, though, which overlaid this, is now the power struggle between the oligarchy and the new managers, the new managerialism, which is mm. really part of the public sector, is part of uh, charity, the third sector as well, which anybody who's involved in I will know about this. And I think it's those two things together which have rattled along for the last 20 odd years. And it's thrown up so many difficulties for all members who naively believed this was a democratic membership organization. And they're just wrong. It is not a democratic membership organisation at all. Um, You're raising some concerns that are relevant to other organisations as well, aren't you, in terms of actually if you're involved in whistleblowing in the NHS, that you you, you raise your concerns within, an, an, within the host organisation that might be very unhappy about areas of bad practice being high, being highlighted. So there's a vested interest perhaps in, in keeping people people quiet which is why people end up with quite extreme having to take quite extreme courses of action i think that's right now and 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 really to reinforce that a a very primitive need in all of us to believe that if something is official and parental it will uh, justice will seem be seen to be done so even today even yesterday when i was talking to somebody who's got a genuine grievance he's still trying to pursue a complaint inside the bps and i know that that is totally futile they will get nowhere with it because we still have this primitive need to believe that a parental respectable organization will look after us and they do not look after us they punish us if we try and raise any question that doesn't suit their interests so so i think you're right to, to pick that up more generally yeah can i can i add to that 
the um, just the discovery. Um, I think I feel that um, Dave and I have probably become experts in what's wrong with the BPS very rapidly, because it's a, it was only November that we started the um, the blog. Uh, that coincided with um, the CEO. Um, going on extended leave, that's the terminology that we must use. It, it coincided with our discovery uh, of something that the membership didn't knew nothing about, which was a serious alleged fraud. Um, and subsequently, we've discovered that that was the latest in a series of financial problems. Now, if, if you want to check this out, uh, partly I think because we've been instrumental, um, along with other people, in putting this secret information into the mix since November. Um, if you want to check this out, have a look at the, uh, the report of the Board of Trustees that's just been presented to the AGM. I've, I did a very critical series of tweets about the AGM um, which I attended and, and I called it dire and it was dire um, there's still this massive problem no problem or if there is a problem we're dealing with it it's all fine you know the BPS is a very rich uh, well-resourced society um, it has over a hundred staff um, all sorts of, of, of things have been going wrong. Um, and the members in the main know nothing about it and will not find out about it unless people um, like ourselves and others and the press, of course, has, has become involved and maybe we should talk about that. Um, unless we make the effort to tell them, it will not appear in any shape or form in internal reports or in the psychologist whatever. Do you want to say something about the press, Pat? Because I have to say, I was quite shocked when I read in the press about the BPS. Um, they, I read about um, the withdrawal, uh, the, the BPS being labelled as a toxic institution yes. and um, concerns about financial irregularities and was quite shocked to, to read that within, um, I think, the Sunday newspapers one week. Yes. So I don't know if you want to say a bit more about the press. Yes, I mean, the, the, uh, the toxic organisation label comes from uh, the involvement and then the walk away of the, the NCVO, the, the National Council that's... for Voluntary Organisation. Yes, who were asked by the BPS to come in um, and decided that they, they, they couldn't do it when they got to grips with what was going on. I mean, my guess, and this is a guess, is that once they talked to less senior staff employees, they soon picked up that this was a very unhappy organisation. Um, yes, there, there have been reports. There have been a number of reports in the third sector, which is a, a, um, a, a publication largely um, aimed at the voluntary sector. Uh, there have been... Uh, one or two reports in the Telegraph and, and also a report in the Times. And uh, actually, we've developed a relationship with a couple of journalists. Um, not all the people that have published, but, but a couple of the journalists we, we've got an ongoing relationship with. Thanks very much. Uh, can I just reflect on, on what you've been saying, and particularly your comments um, about the um, guidelines relating to gender, Pat, because what, what I mean, a, a phrase that as psychotherapists we use not infrequently is about attacks on thinking. And of course, we're used to attacks on thinking in the consulting room, in our general discourse through the press or on the political field. But when attacks on thinking become legitimised through rules and laws, and of course, they become particularly dangerous that was my thoughts anyway yes i, I mean that that's absolutely right um the, the the gender guidelines are clearly ones that are associated with a particularly 
thorny issue um, socially at the moment in terms of discussion. You know, even if if debate were flowing free, freely, it would still have its contra serious controversies, and it would have its inadequate research base to draw on. Um, it would also have its legal problems in the sense that there are ongoing, uh, you know, there was a judicial review that there, there are, there's another uh, set of things going on legally at the moment that are up in the air. And in fact, the BPS have used the excuse to me um, that they intend to review those guidelines when this is resolved legally. Well, actually, one ought to be able to produce guidelines about psychological practice that do not necessarily depend on which way the law swings on certain things. Mm. That seems to me a fundamental flaw in the way that they're thinking about this. Um, those guidelines are produced with um, a rider on them, which says that they are for consumption by social workers and therapists of various kinds, not just psychologists. They also talk about um, you need very specialist training. They, they sort of have a little section on, on the requirements for elite practitioners to deal with things to do with, um, with gender, which the whole thing is incredibly worrying when you read it and unsuitable for supporting practitioners and protecting the public and and, and to add to that part and just to reinforce the point we made earlier that when people did try to draw attention to this this wasn't that's an idea in this you know there were there were lobbies there were there were multi-signet signed letters to the ceo about this these problems they were simply ignored so that the it, you know, the metaphors abound about the BPS. Some people say trying to get through to the BPS is like trying to knock a wall down with a tennis ball. I mean, I, I tend to think of it as a rubber wall, which expels things. Some people talk about it being a rabbit hole. I mean, the whole complaints procedure is a complete joke. Uh, it's selectively used. For instance, I'll give you, here's an example. It says that um, the BPS is not in a position to actually investigate complaints against individual members. That's one policy statement it makes <laughs> on its website. When it suited it, it investigated an internal complaint, which was trumped up about Nigel McLennan, the president-elect, and they expelled him. So when it suits them, they selectively attend to what, a compla what is a complaint and how it can be pursued. I mean, this is a complete farce. We're dealing with what used to be called a banana republic. You know, it's just, these are people who just make up the rules as they go along just to suit their own interests. It's that scandalous. It really is that scandalous. Um, and there are layers to it. And I think the blog is just trying to sort of hint at all these layers and just hope that people will take more of an interest in it. Gender is one of many. It's not the only yeah. one. Yeah, maybe we ought to mention the, the memory-based evidence um, issue too. Yeah, that would be good if you could outline what the concerns about that were then, perhaps. Okay. Maybe. A, a, a very a very simple rerun of that, which is that um, this was a controversial issue in the late 90s, and eventually in 2008, a, a group was set up uh, which focused on producing a report about uh, what was then called the recovered memory debate. Um, and the report was, was uh, produced by a, a group of psychologists who had a particular line about this, uh, which was that its focus was on false positives. The idea that this uh, question uh, was, was resolved by simply identifying the problem that in experimental conditions, you can demonstrate false positives uh, about people's memory. And on the back of that, that became enlarged to a whole rhetorical document about how psychology should be used in legal settings. Fine, that was 2008. That was a restricted number of people who did that. Then what happened was a series of other psychologists who didn't agree with this because their concern was with false negatives, particularly in relation to child protection, particularly in relation, for example, to the glib tendency of most sex offenders to always say that they didn't do it when they're asked. Of course they say that. Uh, because sex, sexual offending, by definition, is problematic to prove. There's very often, Usually there's very little forensic evidence post hoc, and it's really reliant upon the victim also being the witness, etc., this is bog standard knowledge to forensic psychologists, to the police, etc. This was completely ignored in that original document. 
They were only concerned with creating an argument which was aligned with the false memory society. Um, and there was certainly a meshment between the BPS and the FMS over time. Um, but my main point here is that it's, and it's reinforcing what Pat says, is there was no holistic review of this whole question of child protection and looking at the evidence for false negatives as well as false positives. Mm -hmm. This then led to a lobby for about a decade. Then in 2018, that culminated in a meeting uh, in which the then president, a woman called Nicola Gale, chaired. It was on March the 28th, 2018. I know that because I've just written about it and I was at the meeting. And it was an agreed that there should now be an open review, a fresh review of the whole topic so that everybody's view could be taken on board and the, the evidence looked at. That, that meeting then triggered indeed a, a group looking at it, which was then arbitrarily closed down last year. And the two people who announced its closure, uh, which were uh, uh, Daryl Connor, who was involved with the first report, and Lisa Morrison Coulthard, who was also involved with the report simply uh, in a peremptory way just closed the, the group down this has led now to a protest after the event by the way and i don't know what's going to happen to that but that just gives you a very quick tour of why this controversy around recovered memories is not resolved in the bps and their answer to it is to shut it down again it's another close down and, and to BPS. say that consensus couldn't be arrived at I mean, if consensus can be arrived at, you almost don't need these kind of reports. You know, it's the thorny problems, the tricky problems, mm. exactly. the controversy that needs mm. to be made of it. And particularly with regard to the presentation of evidence in court, uh, in the sense that um, <laughs> it will be argued within the context of adversarial situations as to what, he, what weight can be placed upon um, a particular uh, prosecution or defence argument about um, events. Um, the BPS is saying, oh, we don't want to go near that, when in fact it's vital that, that practitioners can say, um, well, this has been looked at by um, our, our um, professional body, our academic body, um, and these are the issues and court will have it at their fingertips then as well as the professionals supported in saying I'm not just it's not just me saying this because you know I've been called for the defense or whatever um, but no they've abandoned that and they abandoned it with a statement in the psychologist that everyone was happy about it being abandoned which we know because we've talked to some of the people involved, is just not true. It's a lie. Mm. Mm. They were furious. Yeah. But it's here, sorry. I was going to say, just to add to it, it's just symptomatic of a cultural norm that actually they just say things that suit their interests. It's, it's hard to describe this to people who are new to the organisation for the first time, particularly if they've been in it for a while and naively believe that it's got integrity. It's, it's very, very worrying. Um, yeah. yeah. And here, you know, that whilst these are particular issues that have come to the forefront and that, that you might be advocating passionately for, what I hear is that it's not the issues that are the concern, it's mm -hmm. the culture and organisation mm -hmm. that actually you want the BPS to be an organisation in which it's possible to have um, dissent and debate and healthy disagreements. Yes. Um, and in, in fact, those efforts to encourage debate um, end up being closed down with only one line of, of thinking being permissible to talk about. I think that's true, Naomi, and I do link that to the structural problem about yeah. poor, poor governance. And I would even extend that argument to policies I agree with. For instance, I'll give you two examples. I, I've been involved as a co-writer on two documents. One is the Power Threat Meaning Framework, and the other mm -hmm. one is the document on psychosis. Now, arguably, they were also a form of policy capture, even though I agree with them. Uh, in other words, what seems to happen in the BPS, if somebody is organised enough and has got a loud enough voice and gets enough people behind them, they can move into these spaces which are ungoverned. That's what happens, including stuff I agree with. And this is why I do return over and over again to the structural problem of misgovernance, which dates back, I think, to 1988. Thank you. And I mean, we've touched already on the fact that both of you, um, neither of you is looking for to be in a 
position of conflict with the BPS. That isn't something you, you don't thrive on, on being in conflict. But I wonder what it is. Some people might wonder why you two haven't just been able to let things lie and move on and, you know, look the other way. Um, what, what is it about each of you? Um, perhaps Pat first. Um, psychology has always been very important to me. I wanted to be a psychologist since I was 13. I remember why I wanted to be a psychologist and, and the discussions I had. Um, so although I did walk away when I retired completely, um, clearly part of me was still very much a psychologist and it matters to me. Um, research matters to me. Um, openness and uh, accountability matter to me. And that that's, yes, okay, that's a personality variable. Uh, that's who I am. When I went to Leeds College of Art, when I retired, we had the usual kind of warm-ups and I, I made a decision to say, and, and I've kept quiet about it a lot, that I was a psychologist because people you know, on the access course, there were a lot of people that, that came from educationally disadvantaged backgrounds. And, and, you know, I didn't want to play that card at all. Um, but we were asked what was important to us. And my immediate reaction was, it's important for me to have some kind of voice. People don't have to agree with me, but I, I do want to be heard. And so subsequently I think the involvement of my family member and seeing how bad things were pushed me over a threshold I mean it is a pain to have this you know there are okay Covid has actually played a part in the sense that I've been able to do less of what I would choose to do normally uh, during the period of time we've got this engagement um, but nonetheless I think for me I had to be pushed over a, a line to say you know maybe this hasn't been my business but in some senses as a human being it's my business. And David you've I mean you've as long as I can remember you've been admired within clinical psychology for being willing to challenge the status quo and challenge conventional practice you have a reputation for being quite quite outspoken is this something that comes naturally to you? Because, you know, I think there's some courage involved, isn't there, in, in going against the flow and speaking up and pointing things out that are against conventional wisdom? Maybe. And, and again, with that, you know, you could do a sort of psychodynamic formulation of why people speak out and others are timid. And it's a complex issue for any of us, I think. Uh, it's interesting, the ambiguity of the word brave now. Uh, brave is, some sort of, is a sort of code for stupid, I think, in people's minds uh, you know so well, that's a very brave thing to do it's a, it's a bit of a dumb thing to do and that's that's an that's a sign of our postmodern times because the easiest thing to do is just to hide behind a moniker on social media and don't tell people who you are which is a which is a cover for both the bullied and the bullied the bullied and the bullying on on social media but um i think some of it is what pat said some of it is also for me that i was always unlike pat i, I wasn't sure i did want to be a psychologist uh, I was always ambivalent from the beginning. You know, I started to sort of genetics actually, and then just fell into psychology. And then I got interested in sociology and I've then latterly got interested in philosophy. I think I've got a bit of a butterfly brain. I'm not that committed to one discipline. Um, but so that's part, a slightly different thing for me. And as a consequence, if you do dip into other disciplines, you find things out and particularly at the boundaries between disciplines. And I've particularly been interested in the sociology of psychology and the history of psychology. And that's why I think I stuck in with the BPS. And that's why I was involved with the history and philosophy section. And so that's taken me down a route, which is one of basically critical thinking, just critical reflection. Why shouldn't we all critically reflect on our own discipline? I think it's a, it should be a, a moral obligation from day one when you're trained as a psychologist. And, and, uh, and on a, reflect on ourselves and, and uh, you know, in a reflexive way. I mean, that's the other thing that is mm. so obvious in the in the BPS that the problem no problem and um, you're the problem uh, you're bullying us and so mm. on mm. Um, so you know the ability to, to to say that we're not always right 
mm. or that psychology is not very good on a particular subject and needs to do try harder. Yeah, I mean, a good example of that part, uh, which is the memory and law stuff, is that the tail's wagging the dog. Actually, the issue, the massive issue of the complicity of society in child sexual abuse is one that we should all be thinking of. And some yeah. people don't have a monopoly on that knowledge. Mm. If we instead stood back and said, look, you know, there have been inquiries in Australia and Britain looking at the underreported child sexual abuse scandal, which has been well documented in the last 10 years. Why don't we just have a perspective on that? Why, do, why instead do we try and turn the, 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 uh, the issue into one of a few experiments around memory? In the yeah. Memory? Why is that? Why? Uh, to me, that's the, tail, that's the tail wagging the dog. I think the question should be that psychology might make a small contribution to a wider interdisciplinary discussion of the public policy problem of underreported child sexual abuse. One of the things to add to that is the where does the where does this weird thing about the dispute about memory based evidence come from? Well, one of the things it comes from within the BPS is the vested interest of two different groups, practitioners who see clients and who may have to go to court and academics who, you know, and I'm a, I was a practitioner, so I'm obviously going to be on that side. Um, the academics who are setting up, as, as Dave says, you know, the Elizabeth Loftuses of this world with their um, the mal experiment and so on, which bears no relationship to traumatic memory. Mm. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the issue is, is to look at reflexivity in the sense of, well, I've got a vested interest, um, psychologically speaking, as a practitioner versus academics saying these pesky practitioners they don't know anything about the research base for this it's all anecdotal now that's what part of that argument's been boiled down to and that's why the research board and the chair of the research board has been quotes calling the shots on this one as you're talking, it makes me think of um, Adam Grant's term for people who speak up and offer constructive criticism to their organisations, and he refers to them as dis disagreeable givers. So perhaps they're seen as troublemakers, but the intention is actually to improve and do better. And you can really hear that in um, what both of you have to say in terms of wanting to learn, wanting to wanting knowledge to evolve, but ultimately wanting. I guess psychologists to do a better job by society um you know and to take take responsibility seriously but I wonder if you have any thoughts on um you know what what happens when people like yourselves aren't willing to speak up you know what would that mean for the BPS and obviously both um have been involved in other cases where actually not speaking up would have would have had costs I think the, the, the direct answer is it means there's a complicit silence about wrongdoing and, and, and in defence, not of us, but of Nigel McLennan, who I mentioned earlier, that we came to know later after we started our campaign, really. He really genuinely attempted as the president-elect to name these problems and demand that something was done about them. And so they punished him. So what he was elected on that basis, actually. Yeah. I mean, he got in a, in a context, I think, of more than two candidates. I think he got 40% of the... Uh, the votes that were cast so you know the membership however sleepy they are about stuff those people who could be bothered to vote did actually want something doing about the situation and he was elected on a on a, um, a, a statement which was very very clear and you can see how how that statement if you go back to that statement you can see how that must have put the cat amongst the pigeons you know, they must have been horrified when he was elected. I say they because there's a problem about who you're actually talking about. Who are the BPS? Are well, they was... the chief executive and the senior management team? Are they the board of trustees? Are they various people in the subsystems? Because a was... lot of statements are issued from the BPS uh, that says the BPS have said. They print this in the, in the psychologist and it's not attributed to anyone. I, I find all of this you know, fascinating because I'm, I'm sure that the BPS isn't 
the only organization which has become distorted in this way. And I think you've given a description really of a culture of an organization that cannot reflect and cannot self regulate. And presumably, that dynamic was built into the culture at a very early mm. stage. Mm. I think it was there, and I keep going on about 1988, but I have to say, before that, one of my heroes in the 70s was a guy called Don Bannister, uh, who's a personal construct psychologist, who was a smart guy, and he said at the time, in principle, this is before all this started, this is in the late 70s he made, made this comment, he said, in principle, the BPS could be a democratic organisation if people got off their backsides and actually contributed, and there was an openness to learning. Uh, the, 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 there is the opportunity for that to happen, but then that but already it was a problematic uh, organization because an oligarchy was, if you go back to the 70s, it was the same names recycled at the top. And then that got amplified for reasons I mentioned earlier about the oligarchy and the managerialism. So this is a deep seated, long standing problem. And you know, the only answer to it is, is really the, is history, is actually to come clean about what's gone wrong. It really is. We have to, it's almost like a sort of truth and reconciliation task this, that people have got to start speaking out about what's really happened in the BPS over the past 30 years. Are you still a member of the BPS, both of you? Till we get thrown Time out. Time being. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, till we get thrown out. Yeah, so, well, obviously it's a very pertinent question, really. Does any of this come to any personal cost to yourselves? For me, it's, it's time. It's got in the way of do doing the other things I wanted to do. It's caused some problems at times in my family as I've become a bit obsessed by it. There's, a, there's always a personal cost to things that actually draw you in in a sort of obsessive way. And you have to be obsessive to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. There's no way around it. It's a daily responsibility, this. So I think yeah, there have been, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't special plead about that. I don't, I mean, it's, this is a first world problem, you know. Uh, I'm not being in, I'm not in a Syrian village being bombed so I, I would like to put this into perspective mm. but it has had a it has had a minor toll upon my mental health I put it that way I don't know what you think Pat. Yeah I mean my situation is helped by the fact that the uh, there are three of us that that organize the blog and Twitter and the third person is my husband my partner Peter Harvey who's also a clinical psychologist or was being retired not quite as long as me but uh, has been retired for some time um, so at least we are both committed to this project as opposed to someone in Dave's position whose partner must be thinking for god's sake you know how how much more of our life is going to be squandered on the on this situation but the, there is a strange thing that happens and that is there is a, a wider group of us that keep in regular contact um, and our morale, if you like, um, cycles. Mm. And sometimes I'm fed up with it. I'm thinking I can't be doing this any longer. Um, when Pete's on a roll with um, writing something, and sometimes it's the other way around. And occasionally Dave and I will have a, a discussion when Dave gets really angry about the fact that nobody's taking issues up. Um, but we, we kind of cycle through this, I think. Uh, that's been the process since mm. November. Um, it would be nice to see some way forward. I, I think I, that would energise me, uh, to see some way forward um, to more people becoming involved and maybe younger people becoming involved and, and maybe people being interested in what the blog could offer it if it was widened as an alternative mm. media for psychology. Mm. You know, if somebody wanted to take it and run with it, uh, that would be great, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, I, I think that's right, but I mean, the only thing I would add is, as a, as a more optimistic scenario, is that beyond the blog itself, we now know we've become sensitised to the fact that a lot of people are very upset about the BPS for different reasons. If there could at least be a network of people who are BPS members who themselves got together and were prepared to be a, a reform group. There's no point doing it inside the BPS. Forget that, because they'll just, they'll just crush you. 
but there might be a, a satellite group nearby around the edges, which we're part of already, which could enlarge, which is, I, I, I'm labeling it something like a BPS reform group, but they've got the concern to reform the BPS, not to, not to wreck it, by the way. We're not trying to wreck the BPS. No. We're trying to rescue it from its own self-inflicted <laughs> wounds. Uh, but uh, as Pat says, we could do with a lot more people networking to do that, to help us do that, yeah. Thank you. It can be very emotionally difficult to find yourself in this position of speaking the uncomfortable truth to power. How have you coped with taking this kind of action? How do you keep yourselves resourced and nourished? And perhaps, Pat, do you want to go first? And, well, you think you've it, had such a flourishing second career. Each, each, each other, really. I mean, that, that is really important. Um, I think the need to offer support to other people has been has been uh, you know an important part of this yeah. um and therefore you know that it's a bit like doing therapy you know it, a lot of it was was painful slog and hard work and and didn't seem to be getting anywhere but there, there were the occasional highs where you really felt you were making a difference and uh, occasionally um just the sense that one is making a bit of a difference about something um it, it is, you know, it's a way of nourishing you, yourself, putting petrol back in your tank. Mm. I've, I've always actually been quite good at putting petrol back in my tank. I, I always had the ability to know when um, something was getting me down and, and, and it wasn't being helpful. And I used to take myself off occasionally and have a wander around uh, something, nothing to do with the problem. Um, even if it was just walking around the shops in the days when you used to go around the shops um so so that kind of thing really i mean um the other thing that there's always been a a great source of um of uh putting petrol back in my tank has been gardening i've got a huge garden um a bit difficult in in winter when the weather's bad but uh and the art now you know so I, i've got i've got at hand even during covid where i am things that that nourish me um and you know the, the feeling that i've still got something to offer i mean we all need that my my husband looks after his almost 102 year old mother uh on a daily basis um and you know those are the kind of things that a you have to look after yourself when you're doing but b you do get a sense that you are making a meaningful contribution to society um, in whatever way. How about you, Dave? Yeah, I'd just rerun what Pat said in a slightly different way. I think solidarity is important between people. I don't, there's no point fighting on your own. You've got to find mm -hmm. people who you can relate to and you can trust and, and mm. you work together. And that's fantastic just to do that as a process. Uh, the second is meaning seeking. I think that yeah. if, if I didn't, if I didn't do this, I would actually feel I was in bad faith, but I would actually feel I'd get depressed. And so I've, I've learned over the years, it's better to actually direct your anger outwards, provided that you're angry about something that's legitimate. There's no point just be angry for the sake of things, but if you're angry about something that's legitimate, that's fine, because it stops you being depressed. It's the sort of therapy, actually, mm. doing it. And, and then linked to that, which has nothing to do with this, is simply to do all the stuff like, I like biking and I like walking and I like yoga and that. I do various physical things, which are much more about my body, because most of the time I'm too much in my head. Uh, so I try and do something which is more embodied. And so I, I'm sort of rerunning what Pat said, but it's in a slightly different way, but it's more or less the same agenda, I think. Yeah. Thank you both. And I, um, I think people can express their interest and solidarity with you by signing up to, on, I think on your blog, there's a way to subscribe to, to that. And perhaps that might indicate hmm. a, a wish to to be more involved in some in creating something that's more positive uh, within the bps yeah. and follow us on twitter too because uh, we have at the moment i think we've got 860 followers but i know that uh, because you can see how many people have uh, how many impressions your tweet has had that we get through to an awful lot more than that number and a lot of people haven't followed us do actually follow us but don't have their name there uh, that people have told me that so so Twitter's a useful 
um, signpost to there's a new blog article. There was there is a new blog article this weekend. What's it called, Dave? The um, the cut the the Martians. Um, what, the Martians could land on the car park and no one would care. That's right. That's the title of, of this weekend's blog. But you got the signpost to that on, on the Twitter uh, pe- um, page. Yeah, I was reading that. And, and I think you say it was a line from a, a song, didn't you? That, mm. that title, yeah. um, which Nothing, I couldn't quite yeah. place. Do you want to give us a rendition of it? Just <laughs> sing it. <laughs> no, I won't sing it, I could, but I can actually just go on Spotify and play it. Yes, uh, I will do. Uh, no, nothing ever happens. Yeah, it's a well-known protest song from 1989. The, the, the only reason I put it in was that it was at the beginning of the same time that the structural problem of BPS started. Thank you. That's that's been brilliant, both of you. Um, we'll put links to your um, Twitter and blog in the Thanks. show notes so that people are able to easily access those. But thank you very much for having such an informative conversation with us, and also for all the effort and work that you are putting into trying to ensure that we've got a professional body that that is actually able to be functional thank you thanks for asking us great to meet the two of you thanks very much indeed okay cheers many thanks again to all of you who have listened to our locked up living podcast feel free to mention this to your friends and to your colleagues and give us feedback on our webpage lockeduplives.com and our Twitter account Locked Up Living. Many thanks too to Pete and Rach who kindly allowed us to use their music. You have called me Courage and this is available from all the usual outlets.